right. <laughs> All right. So we are we are live, and so people are joining us. And um, uh, I think Sarah, you know, we were talking about this this earlier. I mean, your background is absolutely amazing. Like it, because it's it's both like beautiful and and clearly Roman. And I'm sure you're going to tell us what it is. But it looks like a lovely carpet as well. It does. It is the mosaic um, from the mausoleum of Gala Placidia. And I, I don't know what it says about me that I was like, I would love to uh, put myself inside of a mausoleum in Ravenna. <laughs> really? <laughs> Um, maybe, well, it's a, maybe it's a metaphor for uh, a beautiful garbage fire um, of 2020, <laughs> but uh, this, this is my favorite uh, mosaic pattern, um, so I would love to make a dress of it or something. I'm sure that Dolce & Gabbana has already done that, but um, yeah, this is, this is my background because uh, behind me is my beautiful uh, bedroom that is also my classroom for uh, the next semester, foreseeable future. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is this is the reality, and this is why I'm really I'm really glad that um, the the rate my rooms Twitter uh, people only did our first um, episode and haven't done subsequent episodes because Varsha won. I mean, like by a long shot, Varsha won. <laughs> but oh, like, yeah. I have no way to compete with with any of that because, like you, like I'm just in a spare bedroom, like so it's like eggshell walls and like my grandparents' um, cabinet, you know, behind me that my parents won't let me get rid of, but don't want in their own house, so. I, I eventually have to move my desk or this table somewhere else, or I have to move my whiskey because I cannot teach with like 20 whiskey bottles behind me at like 11 in the morning that'll like worry some students or confuse them. So I should, I have to move the table or I have to use a virtual background uh, at some point. But yeah, I, I like doing it for, for drinking with historians because it shows that I have taste. Yes, most of ours is is gin and Irish whiskey um, because nice. when you're married to a man who was a bartender for many many years, but also um, who uh, who is a Irish modernist, then <laughs> you get the good stuff. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, my husband was a bartender for a long time at a dive bar called the Foxhead. Um, which is very famous here in Iowa City because um, we are the home of the Writers' Workshop. Um, and that means that um, all Writers' Workshop uh, authors like to go get blazingly drunk at the Fox <laughs> um, and then get thrown out. So I'm pretty sure that my husband has thrown out some award-winning writers um, from various <laughs> bars here in Iowa City. Um, and he also made this, this lovely drink that I am drinking uh, right now. I did not make this. So. Yes. Nice. Well, I mean, it, it must be kind of amazing. There's, there's probably like, and in, in, in maybe we'll have to talk to him at some point, is that the notches on the bars for like how many Pulitzer winners each mm. like bouncer has thrown out because it's probably more than one. So. Well, there are tables actually at the Foxhead um, that have stories connected to each of the tables of like what were drunk by various writers and which ones passed out mm. and which ones, you know, <laughs> thrown out and, and can never come back. Um, so yeah, the bars in Iowa City have such a rich oral history because um, the Writers' Workshop is like 95% drinking and hanging out with people, or at least it was prior to COVID, um, and 5%, you know, dedicated writing in workshop. Because workshop only happens, I think, once or twice a week, and the rest yeah. of the time, they're, they're soaking in middle America. Um, and by that, I mean, like, whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta join just... this thing. Yeah, or so right, like yeah. mining kugels and schlitz and, um, you know, beer. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, speaking of alcohol, yeah. what is everybody drinking? So I'm, I'm drinking something that I'm very proud of. It took me a week to make. Uh, it wasn't difficult to make. It just took a week to settle. So basically, last week, I took half a bottle of Bullet Bourbon because I don't really like Bullet Bourbon. Don't come at me. Um, and so I poured it into a mason jar, added a bunch of freshly diced mangoes into it, and then left it in my dark pantry for a week. And then I just opened it and strained it today. And it smells like regular bourbon. It smells like Bullet Bourbon. But then when you take a sip, it's like the best mango whiskey cocktail I've, I've ever had. It's amazing. I could literally infusions. have gallons of this. Infusions are deeply underrated, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, well, I am having a Hugo Spritz, uh, and I'll quickly just give the background. I don't know the history of exactly how it came into existence, but um, Garrett Fagan, who is uh, used to be, is still, but is no longer with us, a very well-known uh, Roman historian. He wrote a wonderful book on bathing in the Roman world. Um, he and I, uh, he was at Penn State. He's my academic brother. Um, and uh, we have the same advisor, and so we would always go drinking and trust every, and he would drink the Hugos before he hit the hard stuff. Um, and uh, Garrett was one of my favorite people of, of all time, and he died just a, a couple of years ago. But before he died, um, my husband and I took his parents, my, my in-laws, to Rome, um, and we all went and uh, drank and trust every in a bar, and we had uh, this, this Hugo Spritz, which is very refreshing, and Romans love to drink it in the afternoons. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's not just the Aperol spritz they like. Um, so when I drink this, I think of, of Garrett, who's no longer uh, with us, but is, is one of those historians you'll, you'll never forget. Um, and uh, it is uh, normally made with elderflower syrup, um, but uh, or elderberry syrup, but you can't really get that in the U.S. So it's made with St. Germain here in the U.S. Um, mint, Prosecco, and just a little bit of lime and soda water. Um, and it's just very nice and, and refreshing um, to, to drink before you, before you go to dinner at 8 or 9 o'clock, usually 10 o'clock, maybe. Yeah, yeah I was going to say 8 o'clock. I mean, that's like, that's just when you're starting to have your, like, aperitivos, oh, yeah. I would that's think. That's like aperitivos, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, when I lived in Sicily, uh, we didn't start dinner until 9.30 or 10.00. Um, oh. That's dangerous for archaeologists, right? Because you basically drink from five o'clock until nine o'clock, uh, and then you get changed for dinner. And by the time you get to dinner, it's like ten o'clock, um, and you've been drinking for five hours. And so archaeology can be yeah. a very it can be a very alcoholic field, um, sadly. So yeah. Well, I would think in Italy as well. I mean, it's it's so hot it's in the summer, you know, when you're often there. I mean, you know, I'm drinking um, uh, what's called an Americano, which is which is a type of spritz as well. And I was introduced this pre-pandemic in the before times when my wife and I went on a um, uh, an anniversary trip and we were in, yeah. in Bologna. And like it was blazingly hot, but sitting outside with uh, this has Campari and some sweet vermouth and then some, just some club soda and then like a nice slice of, of orange in there. It's just it just it just makes it all go away. You know, if you're sitting there with this 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 lovely drink and looking out, uh, we found this lovely cafe looking over the, 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 the Piazza Santo Stefano, like this beautiful old 11th century church. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's just kind of perfect. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so, and, and speaking of Rome, I mean, I, I think this is this is kind of appropriate because um, I realize like we're ten minutes in, we haven't even introduced our guest yet, Varsha. We're, oh, we're we're terrible at this whole thing. So um, we are, we are so pleased to be joined by Dr. Sarah Bond, um, who's an associate professor at the University of Iowa, um, and uh, she is a Roman historian. And so I guess the first thing we have to ask you here, after since we've we've been talking about alcohol, is now. Is it okay? Like, how do you build your whole career since basically the only thing that you can write about is the movie Gladiator? Yeah. Right. That's yeah. very true. It's all anybody knows about Rome. Although HBO <laughs> Rome, uh, I, I always tell people that, like, um, I, I long ago when HBO Rome came out, I was reviewing it um, and I was watching it on an airplane and I was kindly asked by the old lady behind me to if I could turn the porn off. Um, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, my dear, I am not watching the pornography. Um, I do that in, in private. Uh, this, is, uh, this is clearly a highbrow HBO show that happens to have like sex, a lot of sex. Um, so HBO Rome and Gladiator are the only things that, that a lot of people do know about, uh, about ancient Rome. Um, but we're, we're trying to broaden the, okay. we're trying to broaden the subjects that people um, become familiar with. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, you know, as a, as a medievalist, I mean, it, it does get tiring writing only about Game of Thrones, but again, <laughs> like you said, like you try to branch out. A, a Night's Tale is on Netflix now. 
I gotta tell you that, you know, if you are missing Heath Ledger in your life and you haven't watched 10 Things I Hate About You lately, um, then you have to watch A Knight's Tale because it is trippy. How many famous people are in there? You're like, is that Paul Bettany? I mean, that's, that's really weird. I actually remember it was seventh grade and we had just finished some form of medieval history unit and the teacher didn't feel like teaching that day, so we watched A Knight's Tale. And Stop the teaching, that's pedagogy right there. <laughs> it, it was it was amazing. I I genuinely think the the his, the history movies that uh, we were sat in front of during middle school definitely pushed us to, yeah. to history, at least me. So I have a, a story about that. So my first real job after I left Washington and Lee, which is where I did my postdoc, I went to I got a job at Marquette, and I was the early medievalist, and they paired me with a very well known medievalist named Leslie Knox who is off the charts amazing. But Leslie is also the most professional person, right? Um, And uh, so I was like, be like Leslie, be professional, right? Be be good at teaching medieval history. So she gave me the medieval history survey to to teach, which she was the first break that she had gotten in a long time. Um, And what what did I do? I had forgotten about the movie, The Name of the Rose, what it like entailed. I knew I loved it. But I remembered it from years prior um, that I had taken a medieval Latin class and been shown it. In any case, so I decided at Marquette, which is a Jesuit school, to show them in full to have a movie night for the name of the rose. Um, And the students just flipped out and covered their eyes. They were just like turning away. Some of them were leaving because I had forgotten that Christian Slater is like 14 having sex in a barn. Um, so, uh, <laughs> be sure to rewatch the movies that you have decided to play for your classes before you actually do it. Because I was like, absolutely, let's watch Black Death. Um, another <laughs> movie where, where, um, where, uh, what's his name dies, like, uh, that, that, um. Sean Bean? Does. Yes, I'm sorry. Sean Bean dies in Black Death. Sorry to give it away, but this is one of the many movies that he's killed. So, we watched Hypatia, we watched Black Death, we watched The Name of the Rose, and my reviews in that course were like, I had never seen anything, I had never seen a movie with naked people until Professor Bond. Um, and that, uh, Hey, that sounds like a 10 on 10 review. I, that's, I don't yeah, know I mean, <laughs> so, I loved being at Marquette. I was only there two years before I left for <laughs> Iowa, but I'm glad that I didn't have to fight for tenure um, and explain a lot of the course reviews from my first semester. Because um, a lot of them were like, I saw Christian Slater's ass. That was so <laughs> 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 <was a> weird. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's probably the biggest ringing endorsement for studying the Middle Ages that anybody can give right now. So, I mean, as a medievalist, I can say to all of our listeners, study medieval history, you can see Christian Slater's ass. But if you study ancient history, you can see Brad Pitt's ass. So Wait, we're like, which movie oh, is we're, that? We're going to do this. We're going to escalate see, asses is what we're going to do. Okay. Um, yeah, I believe in Troy you do see um, Brad Pitt uh, as Achilles. Um, I, I, they made it, um, Brad Pitt made it with his own kind of studio that he and Jennifer Aniston used to own together before the divorce. And so, I mean, I believe he chose this. I mean, he wanted us to see, um, and we can oblige him by watching (laughs) Troy and mocking him. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, this is at the very beginning of Achilles, I think when, um, Briseis, uh, or I'm sorry, when Chryseis uh, comes into his tent, um, because there's like a love story, but once again, you cannot have consensual sex with somebody who has been taken captive. So, you know, it's weird. It's fraud. Um, yeah. It's not good. But you do get to see Brad Pitt. So. so in in your own work, do you work on like the major like classical myths or do you, do you work on some other aspect of Roman history? No, um, I, I specialize in the period of late antiquity. Um, And so uh, I went into graduate school at the University of North Carolina, 
Um, I'm a Tar Heel, but I kind of say it a little more softly than I used to um, because it's been a rough few years uh, to be a Tar Heel. Um, and I'm not in agreement with most of the decisions that happen at a um, upper level. Um, the history department I'm greatly proud of and, and, I, and I love being um, an alumna of the history department. But that's a full stop after that. Um, so, <laughs> in any case, I study late antiquity, um, which is this period that that people uh, call the later Roman Empire, and uh, is very much associated uh, with the fall of Rome. Even though I, I guess um, I take a line that there was much more of a cultural transition than necessarily a fall. Um, so Ooh, yeah, okay. I, I, I know about mythology and I, and I talk a lot about reception history in my more popular work, but um, I am trained as a Roman legal and economic historian, even though nobody ever knows that anymore. Um, when, when people introduce me now, they usually talk about my Twitter handle and about polychromy and it's like, um, I also know the Theodosian code backwards and forwards, but nobody wants to really talk about that. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the Theodosian Code, because I am it's here so for it. Boring. So boring. Um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's no. a bunch of laws. <laughs> I, I get very, very excited when I hear about legal history. So I guess my first question is, how different is late Roman law from what we think of as law? Um, by what we think of, I mean like me, an American, or even Matt, an American who's also a medievalist, who knows what medieval law, like how different is late Roman law? Well, I think the, the big thing I talk to my students about in my Roman law course is the distance between um, actual laws and then social reality. So here's the thing is that most of the Theodosian Code and most of the Codex of Justinian and the Digest of Justinian and all of these late antique laws almost I won't say none of them, but a large percentage of them are not enforceable um, in the late mm. Roman Empire, right? But they are a good example of political rhetoric. Um, and so what I talk to my students a lot about is how do we, um, can we take legal history, can we take legal evidence, and then say that these things actually happened and to what degree did they happen? So my favorite law is from the late fourth century and it outlaws the wearing of pants in the city of Rome and the city of Constantinople, right? Because pants are barbaric and they are very much associated with Visigoths, Huns, um, people who are unsavory individuals, at least to um, uppity Romans who only wear togas. Can you really enforce a law that says that you cannot wear pants um, and, and that you have to wear certain um, accoutrement throughout the entirety of the empire. We know that these laws were disseminated in Constantinople and Rome um, to try and keep people from dressing like a barbarian. Um, but could that really happen? Could, could the very limited police force that Rome had and Constantinople had, very small numbers of soldiers compared to the police forces of today, could they actually enforce not wearing pants and having to wear a toga? Um, and, and that's the kind of one example I give to my students, but I think it's really hard in legal history to say it used to be like, this is the law, ergo, this happened. And the kind of movement within legal history now is to say, what type of rhetoric was disseminated and can we use that to extrapolate some sort of social reality? And it's super hard. You, you really... Um, you really can't say that just because a law exists means that that people actually followed it. Because I jaywalk all the time. <laughs> I mean, I break the law. I, I mean, I think many of us probably break the law, I don't know, two, three times a week um, on various like lower levels, probably. Um, but, uh, but yet those laws would suggest that, that nobody is doing it or nobody should do it, right? So yeah. Um, but yeah. legal history is not as exciting as, um, as, as blogging or tweeting. Um, so, so people don't normally call me a legal scholar anymore. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to, sorry, oh, if go I, ahead. Just, I just want to follow up on this really quickly because I mean, you, you have this phenomenal book which came out a few years ago about uh, disreputable professions, which is just, just a lovely title. I mean, like, it seems there that that's, that's a way, I mean, you know, you're saying legal history is a very exciting, but you're also talking about it kind of as, as, 
you know, social policy or social rhetoric and, you know, you know getting at kind of the lived experience of, of the late Roman world, right, whether it be in East and West. And so how did that, how did that kind of approach kind of inform, like, how did you get to the book, I guess? You know, if you're taking, you know, something like um, the Theodosian Code, the Justinian, Justinian Code or something like that, like, how did you, how did you extract out, like, this is, this is kind of the subject that I want to, I want to focus on. All right, so um, my advisor is Richard Talbert. Um, I just want to say this because it's the thing I'm most proud about with Richard, that I adore him as a second father, but also he was at Cambridge at the same time as John Cleese, and he looks like John Cleese. <laughs> like, what's trippy is that he was there at like the same time as the Monty Python guys. I think like 50% of Monty Python was Oxford and 50% was like Cambridge pretty much, mm -hmm. and then one guy um, who's from Minnesota. In any case, um, you know, Richard, uh, he wanted me to come to my PhD uh, thesis very organically. Um, and I came to him and I said, well, I want to talk about collegia of gladiators. And collegia um, is the plural of collegium, which is where we get the word college from. And it just essentially means a union. Um, and, and labor unions were something that existed in antiquity. And so I began to become very fascinated by gladiators that had created their own kind of um, familia and, and association. So I began to become very interested in collective labor. Um, and uh, Richard was like, listen, please don't do something on gladiators. <laughs> like, do not do something. Uh, he was like, there's so many other topics that you can do besides charioteers and gladiators. He was like, look at other people um, who have formulated essentially labor unions or what we might call in the middle, middle ages guilds um, and, and try and figure out um, particularly um, how these workers are perceived and why they would create unions. And so um, I started doing a lot of labor history and a lot of looking at laws that governed um, the creation of labor associations um, and finding that certain workers were considered to be disreputable um, at various times by Roman laws. So funeral workers were seen as disreputable um, Prycones, which are also known as town criers. Um, and uh, I also have a chapter on bakers and people who handle foods that are seen as sensual. Um, and so, uh, you know, Romans have a very fraught relationship with manual labor, as do ancient Greeks. Um, and so, uh, in terms of what Aristotle wrote about as well, like manual labor was really looked down upon and uh, kind of I began to become very interested in how um, enslaved and manumitted workers in particular in these various trades um, would create labor unions in order to overcome adversity and oppression. Um, so a kind of relevant topic, um, I think, for, for today, because I've always been a huge supporter of unionization and collective labor um, in modernity. Uh, and so basically I took a lot of my interests um, as, a, uh, as a supporter of unions today and began to explore whether those existed in antiquity. Um, so the book, uh, I went back to Richard and I said, okay, not gladiators, but how about funeral workers and um, grave diggers? And he was like, do we have evidence on grave diggers? And I was like, yeah. So uh, that's, that's where it took it from there. And he's always been supportive. And then um, in order to move into the Middle Ages, because the book goes um, up to 800 CE, I went to um, a good friend of yours, Matt, um, who, was, who was my medieval advisor, whose name is Brett Whalen. Um, and uh, Brett Whalen looks like D'Artagnan from The Three Musketeers. Um, true story. Um, I will send a yeah, link. So like since you shaved the... The, the goatee but yeah. uh, well yes now now he looks younger but you know it when yeah. i was his ta it was kind of like indiana jones like the girls would close their eyelids and it would be like i love you <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> brett brett is um you know brilliant and he is the medievalist that he helped me transition into the middle ages because he was young and I used to house it for him and I almost burned his house down. Um, and he did, not, uh, he did not stop talking to me after I almost burned his house down and then he became my advisor, so. <laughs> I'm 
there's so much in this story, but I just want to like, <laughs> couple, just, I, his, look, his cat jumped out of a window, okay? <laughs> we were cooking dinner as the cat jumped out of the window. The smoke started billowing. Then the smoke t- turned off the ADT alarm. And then the ADT alarm called the fire department. And then the fire department called Brett and Melissa. And then they were like, what is going on? And we were like, the cat jumped out the window. Dinner is on fire. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> but Brett but, continued to, to talk to me and to work with me, even though um, I was not this, I was not a good house sitter. I was a bad house sitter. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but taking a couple of steps back, I had no idea that like unions, as we would think of unions, or even like other forms of them existed back then. Uh, and I think that's just so cool to think of that like, laborers are collectively organizing and then like the law itself is reacting to this collective organization well Um, yeah romans romans are very suspicious of collegia um romans also at night i should mention that romans are very suspicious of any kind of club or any kind of confraternity that that gets together at night so a lot of the laws that we have um, even going back to the 12 tables, which are the, the earliest legislation that we have from the Roman, uh, from the Roman monarchial period, um, is really uh, telling us that, that um, they don't even want to have uh, confraternities that, that get together during the nighttime. So a lot of laws specifically stipulate night versus day, um, and there is a—it's very suspect. And and I think I think of the same thing when I when I think of today's laws um, about curfews. I mean, I think there is an inherent distrust of people who gather together um, at night, right? And we're seeing this in Kenosha right now. We're seeing this in places like Chicago, Iowa City. Um, all over the country is that um, a lot of these attempts to disband people by simply saying you can't get together in the cover of night. Um, and that's very Roman and also very fucked up in general. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I have, so I, uh, being, you know, a natural masochist, last night I watched um, the president's speech for an hour and 11 minutes or whatever. And the thing that jumped out at me was like his obsession with a certain type of American history. And I was thinking about talking, you know, talking with you two today, and I was thinking about all I know about Roman history is how every single, mainly British people, but also white people in general, like hearken back to the days of Greek and Roman democracy and culture and like class uh, and, and classicists and all that type of stuff. And I guess I was wondering, how do you respond to, to people, be they students or just people in the public who have a certain nostalgic or very simplistic view of Roman history that, that, you know, basically helps them with their preconceived notions of today. Like, does that happen a lot or how do you, how do you combat that? Gosh, yeah. I I mean, I think that classics has been used for a long time in order to buttress a argument for white supremacy um, and for the idea of Western civilization. Um, And I guess my feeling over particularly since, oh, I don't know, November 6th of 2016 or so, um, has has been to try and disabuse people of that notion. I mean, when I first started blogging for Forbes um, and working as a, as a columnist for them, I think a lot of my columns were like, top 10 Roman emperors. Like, it was pretty <laughs> innocuous. <laughs> It was pretty innocuous bullshit because um, uh, Obama was president and we had all agreed that racism had died, Um, right? Um, And I'm just kidding there. I am well aware that it had not. Um, But uh, I felt as though um, blogging and speaking to the public um, characteristically changed after Donald Trump was elected uh, as president. And um, I, I think many people within the classics community and me, many people within uh, the community of academics that identify as medievalists began to see that um, having, having a relationship with the public that was innocuous and just kind of fun um, was not genuine to what we actually um, should be doing. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times classics and medieval history have been used in order to justify the marginalization of, of people within the United States. And so 
Yeah, I mean, this feeling that the Roman Mediterranean was just full of white people with British accents is because of casting decisions during the 20th century and because white men are in charge of those casting decisions. Um, and because also Americans like British accents way too much, okay? Um, <laughs> I, I should just mention that maybe Americans should stop loving British accents that much. Um, I mean, all of us enjoy uh, a, a good uh, listen to the BBC, but um, a lot of my students even believe that um, there was a whiteness to the Mediterranean that wasn't really true. And so I've spent a lot of time, but also so many colleagues within classics um, have spent a, a great deal of time trying to deconstruct the narrative of whiteness within the ancient Mediterranean. And uh, it can be a tough, uh, it can be a tough bite, uh, but I do think that we're starting to chip away at the idea that the Mediterranean was full of people that all look like Colin Farrell, um, or all look like, um, I don't know, almost every- Brad Pitt's butt. That, yes, Brad Pitt's butt. Yeah. Uh, I, was thinking, yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking of the fact that the guy who plays Caesar in HBO Rome is in like, is also in Game of Thrones, and like they only mm -hmm. have, I believe, twenty five people who act in, in England, um, and so there's a lot of crossover between Game yeah. of Thrones and everything on else on HBO. But um, yeah, I, I do think that that's been a big thing that that I've tried to work on, but also many other people within classics and, and medieval history. Um, including Matt and including um, David, uh, who has also been on the show as well, I think. So, I, I mean, this is just, uh, it's been a, a really big problem that classics gets used as a way of pointing to why the West is best. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned something there and, and we're about to, I want to get to, to questions because we have some really wonderful questions from, from, um, from the viewers here. But, uh, you know, this turn towards public engagement, you know, I think for, for a lot of academics who are doing this work that you were just describing, it, a lot of it happened after the election of Donald Trump, in which, for better or worse, there was, there was kind of, well, I think for the better is that there was an awakening to the way that, that especially medievalists and, and people in, in classics, the way that the, the, the field was being used. Um, sometimes very intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, but yours predates that. And so like, what, can you talk a little bit about kind of what led you to that? Cause as you said, like, you know, you used to write for Forbes, you're now a columnist for hyperallergic, uh, you know, have a wonderful column there. So like, you know, this is kind of continued for, for, you know, I mean, you, you, you predate us, you know, like for people like Varsha and I who are doing this, this work right now. So. Well, um, Okay, so it all started because uh, I had already turned in my dissertation and uh, the Arab Spring had begun. It was 2011 mm -hmm. and uh, I, I noticed that uh, there had been a law that was passed uh, in Egypt that no portrait or visage of Hosni Mubarak or his family could be erected anymore and all current statues and pictures of Hosni Mubarak had to be removed. Um, and this is very reminiscent of the memory sanctions that Romans would impose mm. really on unpopular emperors like Caligula or Nero um, or Domitian or Commodus, for instance. Um, and uh, this was something that I then brought to Brett Whalen um, and I brought to an early Americanist named Kathleen Duval, who was at UNC as well. And I was like, I feel like I could write an op-ed about this because Kathleen was writing op-eds for the New York Times at the, at the time. Um, and uh, she does the 4th of July column uh, every year for early America. And so I went to Kathleen and Brett and they were like, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> And uh, so I just, I wrote a piece for the New York Times about um, Damnatio Memoriae um, and memory sanctions and erasures. Uh, and it got published. And I, I mean, I, I just, I, that's the first kind of like real thing for the public I had written because I had just gotten a break from my dissertation. Um, and people really weren't doing a lot of blogs. The only person that yeah. I knew that had a blog was my best friend whose name is Christina Kilgrove um, and Christina I was uh, 
you know, inspired by her blog, which is called Powered by Ostians, and she's a bioarchaeologist. And I mean, everything that Christina has done, I basically just tried to imitate and be like her because um, I don't know, she's just wonderful. So Christina was hired by Forbes first, and then she was like, I also have a friend uh, named Sarah Bond. Um, and I had been, ever since that New York Times op-ed came out, I had been blogging on my own. And then um, Alex Knapp at Forbes asked me to write for them. And then Prague Vartanian at Hyperallergic saw some of the uh, columns that I was writing for Forbes and asked me if I wanted to write anything for Hyperallergic. And eventually I left Forbes, not because they're bad people, um, but because Hyperallergic's mission is about social justice and uh, people who have been marginalized. I mean, hyperallergic is run by a, a gay couple who, uh, who started it um, in order to counter the bullshit of the art world. Um, and uh, Harag is Armenian and Canadian, and he uh, has editors of color. So it was the first time I'd ever worked with an editor who was Black, right? Like that I worked with um, my current editor whose name is Seth Rodney and my writing completely changed because Seth calls me on my bullshit as a small white lady. Um, and I had never had anybody um, edit me and, and reform my words and make suggestions to me um, that were as valuable as they are at hyperallergic. So it started because I had two professors at UNC who encouraged me. I had many people that told me not to publish that New York Times op-ed, um, including my advisor, it must be said, and my undergraduate advisor, because they thought that it would cast me as a political pariah, right? Like nobody would hire me because I was um, interviewing at the time at Washington and Lee, and why would a conservative institution want to hire me? Um, and, uh, and from there, it, it was vastly helped just by people who were kind and lifted me up. So whether that was Christina, or whether that was Frog, or whether that is Seth, I mean, all of these people just opened doors for me that I just really appreciated. Um, and that's why uh, I think that public history is, is so important, but also the editors that work with you are incredibly important to, to how successful and how good your writing are. And yet you almost never see them. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why I've stayed with Hyperallergic, even though I haven't written anything for a few months because I've been on maternity leave. Um, but uh, Hyperallergic is, is the model of a social, social justice publication that, that I hope that I can, you know, always be a part of. So, and I don't say that just because they pay me, um, because it's not really, <laughs> not really that much. Uh, it, yeah. it, it's not about the money. It's, it's more just about yeah. like um, being surrounded by people that inspire you. Um, and I loved Forbes, but to be honest, a lot of the people that I was surrounded with as columnists didn't inspire me in, in the same mm. manner because it was mostly like business and finance people. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It just, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Matt, you came after uh, me after I left and, and mm -hmm. you are very inspirational and Christina is, but I got to say like most of the Forbes columnists, I associated a lot with conservatism um, and, and with a, a point of view that I didn't want to be lumped into mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah to be to be There's, completely frank yeah yeah no and i think that, I, I think there's two things and i want to make sure we get to questions because we've been saying yeah. that for a while but um <laughs> but but two things is that um the importance of, of an editor is really interesting and something that i I've, I've been learning about you know as i've started to do uh, my own public writing is that because in the academic community right like you just you don't engage with with editors in kind of the same way and like they are so good at what they do oh, so yeah. often. Like, like you realize, like you turn in a draft to them and then they send it back to you and you're just like, wow, thank you for yeah. putting up with me because this is so much better and what I wrote was crap. Um, uh, and and it's, yeah. it is hard for some academics to kind of to kind of grasp that, even though we, we know that there's iterations and drafts and stuff like that. And the people, um, I, I think what people
people don't really realize um, because they'll be like, oh, hyperallergic, is that just an arts journal or, or something like that? But a lot of their editors then go on to be hired by the New York Times or by the New Yorker, yeah. by like bigger publications. Um, and it's amazing to work with these editors before they hit the big time, like, because it, it, the, these are people that that um, they give you suggestions because I've lived as an academic since I was five years old. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I've actually never left school. I was a waitress, mm -hmm. I bartended, but essentially, and I was an archaeologist, but all that time I was also still in school. Um, so benefiting from people who live in the, in the real world on some level, uh, because I myself have been either in um, a school uh, setting or a professor for the entirety of basically my life. Um, and that is way too much of a, a sheltered existence to, to be able to write for a popular audience oftentimes successfully. So yeah. Yeah. I need I, editors to, I need editors to be like, Sarah, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I was recently asked to write a piece about the dam failures in Michigan. And so like when I was writing that piece, I frantically sent it to like a bunch of people who were editors as well as like the actual editor at the magazine. And after I got all these edits back, I was like, oh, wow, am I just a horrible writer? And then like I got over that and realized this is like how you learn. But like this is why editors have the coolest jobs but the hardest jobs man. oh yeah um and it's definitely really important when you think about newsrooms um and the types of people that that they hire but also the types of stories that they put out um i think that's like a really good point uh, and a good thing for people who are in academia to think about when they publish outside of academia is to make sure that you are not just publishing in an outlet that you want to be associated with but that you have the support you need to before you hit that publish button or you know you're not going to be happy with your piece um yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Should we move I, to questions? Yeah, we just, totally agree with you Varsha. Yes. Yeah. yes we don't talk enough about academic kindness sometimes so because there are plenty yeah. of terrible people out there but there's also some really <laughs> really nice people there so oh, yeah. um so anyway but we've been putting this off enough we've been talking <laughs> oh well whatever it's our show we can do whatever we want right Varsha? yeah um yeah so exactly. so welcome to the second half as i have to say <laughs> drunk with historians so we'll get to some questions now all right Varsha, do you want to do you want to pick the first one or do you want me to yeah i think somebody asked a really relevant question um so you mm -hmm. brought up how law is actually how it is written and how it is enforced and then you brought up policing so someone asked if you could mm. talk more about roman policing how did rome use its policing resources like were there certain crimes or businesses or populations that are targeted more so than others Absolutely. I, I think the best book on this, and again, he is my academic brother. Uh, he has the same PhD advisor, but his, his name is Chris Berman, and he has a book on policing the Roman Empire, um, and it talks a little bit uh, about how this functioned in Roman society, because um, up until Augustus, even, we didn't have vigiles. Uh, vigiles uh, are uh, where we get the word vigilantes from, but essentially they just mean night guardsmen, um, people who, uh, who guard things at night. And they were also the fire brigade. The vigiles are, are known as the fire brigade. Um, and also Roman uh, or Augustus institutes um, a, a number of what we might call police uh, that, that are situated in the various 14 regions of Rome. Um, so uh, Augustus really is the one that moves the police from kind of a private force or a city man force um, into a much more um, state sanctioned model, but not all cities even had them. Um, so we have a very small amount of what we might call a police force. And then you also have the use of soldiers particularly on frontier zones. So if you've seen Life of Brian, um, you probably <laughs> are aware that in areas where there was a lot of revolt or where there was a new frontier that needed to be uh, more colonized and settled by troops, um, that oftentimes Roman soldiers would be instituted within that city or that area. Um, and so uh, soldiers could be incredibly unkind to people, but Roman law stipulated, as we know, um, both from, from legal standards and say from the Acts of the Apostles, that citizens were protected from corporal violence. 
So if we think about George Floyd, if we think um, uh, about much of the violence against citizens within America, um, at least legally within the Roman uh, system, uh, you were not supposed to uh, ever corporally touch a citizen in the Republican early empire. Um, that is why Paul is arrested. Um, Paul is arrested and he is then given the choice to be put on trial and he says, I want to go to Rome because that's one of the legal rights you have as a citizen of Rome is that you can be taken um, to Rome for trial. But remember that um, Peter uh, is going to be crucified and he chooses to be crucified upside down um, because he doesn't want to imitate Christ. But the reason that Peter can be crucified and Paul has to be beheaded are because you have a citizen and you have a non-citizen. Um, so I think it's really important when we are looking at policing today, um, I'm not saying Romans are better because they enslaved people. Like 25% of Italy at one time was enslaved. So I'm not defending Romans, but I am saying that they believe that Roman citizens should not be corporally vulnerable. Right. So, um, so, so, no, did you, were you going to say something else, Sarah? No, that, I, I mean, I, I, okay. I think Paul and Peter are my kind of go-to examples, yeah. but citizenship was supposed to be protective armor from being beaten by police, from being beaten by soldiers. And it didn't always work, but um, there was a belief that citizens deserved a corporal deference that we don't have for black bodies today. Right, yeah. that we don't have for black bodies in the United States, um, and and so I think it's it's something worth mentioning um, that that uh, bodies have a hierarchy um, within America that Romans at least legally said they didn't um, buy into. So. so, so kind of following up on that, we have a few questions about kind of the um, conceptions of class in the Roman in the Roman world. I mean, one of the things you talked about earlier when you were talking about the collegia. Um, or, or sorry, the collegia um, from uh, of, um, the, of the gladiators and grave diggers and stuff like that is that um, enslaved peoples, people of lower classes, could be part of them as well. If I'm remembering correctly, mm -hmm. perhaps I'm not. Um, but so, so were there like like how did the class system kind of work within that? Um, you know, you're talking about this division between citizens and non-citizens, but I would assume there's there's gradations and then there's there's other issues at work as well. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think the thing that, that most historians would point to as a way of um, understanding Roman hierarchy is the patron-client relationship, is okay. that um, lawyers generally did not get paid, at least within the Republican early empire. Later on, they did, but Cicero wasn't taking like cash payments. Um, he mm. was doing it as a service to his clientes and to his friends and to people who came and asked for him to uh, defend him in court. Um, so if you understand the advocates, which is what we would call lawyers today, advocati, um, they are doing this pro bono or really just for like um, favors in general, you understand that, that a lot of Roman hierarchy is solidified by the fact that you have a patronus or a patrona that is at the top and they have uh, dozens if not hundreds of clientes. Uh, within within their service. And so a lot of this is about having very wealthy patrons um, and then clients that are at like lower levels. Um, and so there's an extreme hierarchy always within the Roman Republic and, and then the Roman Empire as well. Um, but it is solidified uh, by this idea that you're constantly having a quid pro quo with the person who is your patron. Right. And so you have um, slaves who are, are chattel, enslaved persons who are chattel and part of what we call the Roman familia. But then you have clientes who may just be poor workers or manual laborers, um, et cetera, that come to the house of the patron in the morning and then they go with them. And then if they're running for um, a magistracy, they may vote for them. Uh, they may like campaign for them. And so a lot of the Roman hierarchy is solidified not by uh, legal caste systems, but by a social caste system that has been mm. uh, created. And it's, it's not completely impermeable, uh, but it's very difficult to rise. And that is why Cicero got a lot of bullshit for being a novus homo, right? Because a new man, a novus homo, um, is somebody who has never before been a part of the senatorial elite. 
Um, and uh, it was hard for Cicero to break into that, that cast of senators. Um, so yeah, the, the hierarchy within Rome is, is, extremely, um, is extremely important to understanding, but a lot of this is about, I give to you and then you give back to me, um, do et des a little bit, which is, means I give and you give, so. So was that was that defined by resources then? Like like who had things to give could become a, a patron? Like so you were talking about kind of the permeability of these classes. I mean, like and so I mean, how permeable was it, I guess, right? Like, I mean, could people move? I mean, you hear these kind of one off stories sometimes, you know, and it, you know, I say this as a medievalist, right? Like I don't know too much about what's going on. But there are these kind of one-off stories, but at the same time, like it seems much more formalized. Like it wasn't it wasn't easy to move, like you were saying. So it wasn't easy, but there were are there are periods uh, where we know that particularly manumitted uh, enslaved men were able to rise through the ranks. And this is a critique of the historian Suetonius who writes about the 12 Caesars, right? That mm. under the reign of the Emperor Claudius, that all these freedmen were actually gaining status, right? And they were replacing equestrians and senators. And probably the most famous story of this is Petronius's Satyricon, which happens under the reign of Nero. Um, and uh, Trimalchio, who is uh, the kind of, <laughs> uh, if everybody, I, I would say, go out and get Fellini's version of, of the Satyricon if you ever can. Although, once again, I don't know why we keep coming back to this. It is a porn, um, if you want to see Fellini's <laughs> Satyricon. Uh, but Trimalchio is a freed slave, right? And he's pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He has latifundia that are all over um, southern Italy, which is to say large estates large amounts of property because Romans value property owners above all else. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we do have these examples, particularly of um, manumitted slaves here and there that we know were able to ascend through the ranks. Um, but yeah, there's no like American dream uh, that people can really point to within, within the, U I mean, I think it's not a real thing within the US and I don't think it's a real thing in ancient Rome. And uh, historians like Walter Scheidel, um, who is the head of classics at Stanford have pointed out that, um, that uh, inequality uh, within Rome was extreme, but in America, we have now surpassed the amount of inequality that Rome has. Wow. So we're not doing great, guys. Uh, the, yeah. the amount of inequality uh, between classes in the United States um, is, is uh, even past, I think, what Romans would, would recognize. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's not, not great. I mean, yeah, it's not. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should drink more to that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, building on how it's not great, uh, the, some, the one thing that I see a lot when people talk about how it's not great in the U.S. is how this is very similar to the fall of Rome. And somebody asked a question about how you mentioned that the fall of Rome is much more of a slower, more contingent process. So could you talk more about that since that's the time period you work in? I know that's a giant question, uh, but like, is there any, like, I think um, what, what this person asked, is there any use, is there any use to thinking about it as like a shift from, of, a set, of a center of gravity? Or is, is it something, is it something else that's, a trans, that's, that's transforming that leads us to call it like a fall of the empire? Yeah, I mean, within academic studies, there have has been this argument, particularly since about the late 60s, but even way before then. Um, uh, but it really got going in the late 60s into the early 70s with the rise of a cultural historian named Peter Brown, um, who is now emeritus from Princeton. Uh, but also from, from uh, women like Dame Averill Cameron uh, and, and uh, then later on a man named Christopher Wickham um, who began to kind of focus on the fact that there is a cultural transition um, rather than a fall, that Rome continues on to live in institutions, ideas, art, culture um, that, that has a continuity rather than something that was suddenly decimated in 410 or 378 or like whatever date you want to give for the fall of Rome. And so on this side, you have a lot of these, let's say Peter Brown people on this side, and then on this side, you have people um, who kind of espouse more the idea, idea of Gibbon, um, let's say of Peter Heather is probably most representative of the idea of the fall over here. 
Um, and uh, I fall kind of closer to the cultural historians who say that the empire is not a monolith, just like America is not a monolith. How can I possibly talk about you in California and, and have the, and, and, and say that you're the same as me in Iowa? I mean, look, I, I, it's, we're just different. And so when you look at estates in North Africa that were still very economically viable throughout the fourth century and then into the fifth century, um, we're talking about um, e extremely productive economically and very stable uh, political regimes in parts of the empire that are not experiencing the same turmoil all over. Right, so you can have a, a stable um, economy, let's say in California prior to the pandemic, um, that is very different from an unstable economy, let's say in Detroit, Michigan, right, or in Chicago. Um, so uh, what I really want people to, to remark on and, and to know is that we can't talk about the Roman Empire as rising and falling all as one. Um, and that just using literature in order to extrapolate the fall is not enough. I can't just read Augustine's City of God and then go, well, it was a shit show. <laughs> like, Augustine was just a shit show because look at Augustine. And it's like, yeah, but Augustine has rhetoric. He has a political purpose for writing City of God, right? So you can't just use City of God as a biography of the early fifth century. I mean, yes. Is he going to die in the Vandal invasion of Hippo? Yes. I mean, does that suck and, and show that, that a lot of the Vandals were coming into North Africa at this time? Yes. But does that mean that the Vandals um, destroyed everything within the entirety of the empire? Uh, no, it doesn't. So um, I, I think it's just about having source criticism and seeing that um, really people who like to make parallels between the fall of Rome um, and the fall of America are in part trying to reestablish um, uh, America as the inheritors of Rome, right? Yeah. Like what their argument really is, is that we are Rome. Um, and what I'm saying is, no, we aren't. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's, and that's yeah. something, I mean, we've talked about a lot, I think, on this show, right, Varsha, is that, um, you know, that, that people who are trying to draw these very simple historical analogies, right, they're trying to sell something, yeah. right, is that they're, they're trying to make a particular political, oftentimes political point, and it's always the historian's job to say, like, no, it's more complicated than that. You can't just yeah. say, like, you know, drag this thing out of the past. And that's that's something, I mean, like, you know, your work, uh, Sarah, has done so so well, is to show, like, these, these false historical analogies, the way that white supremacists, for example, have appropriated kind of the, the ancient world, is that they want to take this kind of prepackaged, easy thing and just kind of drag it into the front, right? Slap a Molan Labe thing on their, their shirt, and all of a sudden they're fucking Spartans, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, instead of the chuds well, that they I really think are, semiotics right? so. lend itself, I, I mean, I think symbols in general and semiotics, that is to say the study of symbols, lend itself to facile um, assimilation, right? In other words, mm -hmm. it's really easy to just um, pick this and pick this and pick this and then take it and then uh, use it as, as a way of legitimizing your own ideology. And yeah. so we saw this in Charlottesville. Right, we saw this uh, in Charlottesville when when we had a lot of the um, a lot of the shields that were being held by um, the the white supremacists at the rallies in Charlottesville. The shields had various medieval but also ancient symbols that were that were on them um, as a way of saying like. I am defending Western civilization and I am a, a legitimate force for the defense of this culture. Um, and again, if you say that Western civilization actually doesn't exist and that there is nothing to defend, then that has deconstructed their entire argument, more so than me just saying like, don't use SPQR that way, or like, don't use the symbol this way. Or, like, I don't wanna shake my finger at people and just tell them not to use symbols. I think the, the point of a lot of those essays were to say like, because Western civilization doesn't exist, your symbol should be impotent. I see what you're doing. I'm going to not only translate what your symbol is, I'm gonna show how it's completely invalid that you've used it. But um, 
behind that is is not even the symbols themselves are are um, interesting to look at, but behind all of that is always the argument um, that there is no Western civilization, that that it is not something that that actually is existing and thus cannot be defended. So fuck you, Steve King. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's leaving, he's leaving office, so I guess I feel yeah. a little bit more empowered to say that, and because I've already had my my Hugo here. Um, but like, you know, get out of here, Steve King. We're ready for you to go. <laughs> right. I, I think we we have to change. We're almost out of time, and if, if you're willing to indulge us, I think I have one more question. I think Varsha has one more question too. One more. Sure. A, a, a number of people have asked, like very briefly, can you explain why Romans thought bread was sensual? What's sensual? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I will uh, put this into um, kind of the show notes and everything, and I won't just be like, buy my book, uh, because it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> a good thing to say to people. Um, but uh, yes, uh, uh, so bread is, is um, a bakers, uh, when they're described by Cicero, he's talking about delicacies, right? He's not just talking mm. about bread when Cicero talks about bakers. He's talking about the corruption of society through cupcakes, right? Through sugar. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have sugar. They have honey. Uh, they, yeah. they don't have sugar cane yet. But I guess what I'm saying is we're talking about things that make people effeminate. Right, um, we're talking about like little cute little pastries and, and um, we're talking about men that instead of working the fields and, and instead of doing things that, that contribute to the state, um, they're creating, uh, they're creating um, commensables that then are bought by the general public. Um, so he lumps this in, it's crazy, he lumps this in with people who buy sensual pleasures like perfume. Right and and people, what he's trying to say is that there are a lot of Greek manual labors that have had an influx into Roman society, and Romans are rejecting these effete manual labors that are coming in from Greece, who do things like massage and perfume people and um, create like. Uh, they they sell big fish, right? And and um, it's the same thing that we do with avocado toast. I mean, it's the same thing we do with Nutella, right? Like real Americans eat peanut butter, um, not Nutella, right? That's very it's too European and shishi for for real America. Um, so that's what Cicero is talking about in De Afficiis. Um, by the time we get to late antiquity bakers become their own caste because bakers contribute uh, to the creation of the anana and the anana is the is the bread dole um, so you get uh, through a lottery in Rome and Constantinople, um, you have a lottery of bread that goes to people. And so by the time you get to late antiquity, uh, bakers become a caste that you cannot escape from. Um, and you have to actually work either in the bakeries or own the, the land that has the bakeries on them um, because bread is so important to the empire. And so you protect a caste by making them ignore by saying that they're disreputable, you give them no other choice but to be bakers and to marry the why, I mean, to marry the daughters of bakers, right? In the same way that medieval undertakers had to marry other undertakers, right? Like medieval undertakers, these are the unerlichen Leuten, uh, which is just a class of, of uh, disreputable people within the medieval world of the 16th century Germany. Um, only undertakers could marry other undertakers right? Um, yeah. From undertaker families. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is like bakers from Cicero represent Greek immigrants and a feminine uh, like influx of luxury and luxury yeah. is not Roman. Um, but by the time we get to late antiquity, they've held on to the rhetoric of Cicero, but actually what it is is the way of creating a caste that creates a commensable that is indispensable to the rest of Roman society. Bread is a central part of Roman diets because meat was so expensive. Wow. So. That's, so That's cool. a long-winded answer to, to just say like bakers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, love bread. Me yeah. too, but 
I love Italian bread. I miss it yeah. a lot. <laughs> oh, I love bread is my favorite thing. Um, okay, so last question I had is a bunch of people have asked because we talked a lot about HBO and Brad Pitt. Um, besides the 2004 Pepsi commercial with Beyonce, Pink, and Britney Spears, what's the best like representation, pop culture representation of Roman history? Like, what do you actually show to your students? That I is. <laughs> I, Claudius? It is. Uh, so Robert Graves oh. was an actual classicist. He, he yeah. was somebody who was trained in Latin and Greek. He was a translator um, as well as an actual historian. Um, and that means that when he wrote I, Claudius, or Claudius the God, which is the follow-up to I, Claudius, um, if you read those books, um, they are incredibly well-researched. And, and Robert Graves um. is someone who is, or, or he's dead now, but like he was a very respected classicist. Um, and so when PBS turned it into, I don't know how many parts it was, it's multi-part, it's like 10 yeah. or 12 episodes. Um, but wow. I show them I, Claudius, even though it reinforces the idea of whiteness and antiquity because it's all BBC British people once again. But in terms of historical accuracy, I have to say I, Claudius, is, is probably um, the gold standard that exists now. I think that we, we can always improve, and I hope that we do improve. But uh, when I show students I, Claudius, they get a little bored because it is so historically accurate. Um, it's so closely based on Suetonius. Um, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they want to see things like Fellini, which is just off the charts crazy. Right, um, uh, but uh, in in reality, I Claudius is probably closer to to what it was like. Um, yes, I, I mean I think you know it, it's going to be a hard thing to break the assumption of or the association I should say between Romans and decadence. Right, is that you yeah. want that over the topness? You want to see Nero's pleasure boat and and all that kind of nonsense. So. And that's the tough thing to, the reason I like HBO Rome is because it's got this British upstairs, downstairs uh, obsession. Mm. It's the same reason I like Bravo's Below Deck, right? Because you have the people who have chartered the yacht, and then you have the people that work in the yacht. Okay, that's very interesting to me. I want to see yeah. Down Abbey. I want to see Upstairs, downstairs is very interesting to me. And so HBO Rome, I think, is really cool because it does take the two regular people, the only two, like, really regular people that are mentioned by name by Julius Caesar in the Bellum Kivoli in, in the um, Civil War um, and, and in the Gallic War. So, I mean, it's, it's really uh, you, the Bellum Gallicum um, that Caesar writes, he only mentions these two regular people. Um, and then that is the launch pad for the upstairs downstairs of Titus Polo um, and Lucius Verinus, right? So you've mm -hmm. got like a soldier and a regular dude um, who are living in the Subara of Rome. And then you've got Julius Caesar. And I think it's brilliant because I, Claudius, basically only focuses on the monarchy, right? But HBO Rome is kind of cool. And I went to the set because it was at, it was at Chinachita before the fire at Chinachita a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, I walked around the set at Chinachita and it was just amazing. But it's not super hmm. historically accurate, although some some scenes are great. Um, but but uh, I do like this idea that we should value the stories of just regular people, and and probably the only time we've ever done that is in Spartac with Spartacus. Um, and you shouldn't have to be a gladiator in order to have your story told, right? Like. Yeah. Enslaved persons deserve to have their story told, even if they aren't gladiators in the arena. And yet that's what we yeah. focused on. And I mean, and that's honestly what my advisor told me as well. Like, stop looking at just the people that are popularized within media um, and, and look to the regular everyday people in Rome um, for their stories. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of been my focus and why my blog is called History From Below is because I give very, uh, I just don't like focusing on, on the great man version of history. I would much rather hear about regular everyday people, but I'm from yeah. Roanoke, Virginia. I'm, uh, you know, from right down the road, 
and so I think it's probably just because I've got this southern chip on my shoulder and because <laughs> I uh, I had to lose my southern accent in order to be an academic uh, and and I probably just like regular people because my dad's from West Virginia and I'm a hick um, and I'm drinking out of a mason jar so before it was hipster cool before it was hipster cool <laughs> That's right. I got sunshine so. for my 18th birthday. For my 18th birthday, okay? <laughs> Whoa. I don't, have, I don't have moonshine for my 18th birthday. So, I mean, I'm real deal like redneck. So, I I feel like I mean, this 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 episode more than any other needs like an exegesis. Like it needs like <laughs> like a foot like a, a set of footnotes to all the stories that that they, they, they've told us, right? And that we need like <laughs> Like the subsidiary six part episodes after this in order to Oh, I have Yeah, there there are so many stories that that I could tell about academia and, and uh, that were I mean living in Lexington, Virginia, um, for for a year is in and of itself a six part series um, about <laughs> white supremacy. Um, but yeah. Okay, just two points on the fact that I have so many questions, you were not charged with like arson or any crime because no. you out of the house and the cat is okay, right? No. Yeah. And we okay. found the cat. Okay, here's the crazy thing is we found that cat because Cliff Haley, who is a French historian who now lives in Iowa City and is still one of my good friends, Cliff went out to find that cat. Um, and the thing is that, that um, what ADT does is they just call you and they're like, is there a fire? And because we had gone out looking for the cat, we just didn't answer the phone to tell them that there wasn't actually a fire. And so that's why they Ooh. called Brett. Um, but in any case, um, Brett never, uh, he, 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 I mean, he is a close friend and him and his wife, Melissa, remain people that I respect, but I don't think they'll ever trust me with their pets again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. But, but yeah, I mean, I have so many stories of house sitting professors' houses and going through their drawers, uh, but I did not do that at Brett's house. I did do that for a famous German historian who is the world's expert on the Berlin Wall. Um, uh, but I, I just really wanted to see what was uh, in his stuff. <laughs> I think we're going to have to end it right there because this is going to be on YouTube later. And I, I, I don't want, Sarah, I don't want, I don't want yourself to get you, you know, to oh, get no, your, was, yourself in trouble anymore. It was, I didn't take anything. I was just kind of like perusing the, <laughs> to see what like the world. I just rifled through it. It wasn't like, I just, yeah, I, I didn't see steal it. The, so. the Berlin Wall had in his stuff. I don't know. I just, uh, <laughs> turns out it's like a lot of books. Uh, it's like, <laughs> really boring. Um, that's the that's Conrad, the thing about most professors, I right? We're just Conrad Yarrow. Yes, yeah, I, much, just, much apologies to him. <laughs> we're incredibly boring. So, um, yeah. thank you so much, uh, Sarah Bond, for joining us yeah, today yeah. on Drinking with Historians, yeah. and uh, thank you everyone for for spending uh, your Friday evening, afternoon, morning, whatever it is, with us. Um, so we're going to take a little hiatus. We're going to be back in two weeks um, now that the yeah. semester has started, but uh, and we don't have a guest there. We'll, we'll, we'll announce that hopefully relatively soon, but uh, look out for that either on Twitter or drinkinghistorians.com. But for now, let me again thank you, Sarah Bond, for, for a wonderful conversation. And um, let me say just at the end, just cheers, everyone. Yes. Can yep. we do, can we do a Roman, uh, can we do a, a, a Roman, uh, Cheers uh, as we yes, of course. salute or uh, so um, Romans tend to use uh, the Latinized Greek, which is uh, paiseses, drink, may you live, right? Paiseses. So, paiseses. Yes, paiseses. Everybody stay safe. Don't get coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah.